Hello everyone, welcome to the Cyber Weekly. The Cyber Weekly is a podcast which talks about cyber security with me, Deokrasha Sokelo, Josephine Olok, and uh, Angela Nabanja. I welcome you all to the show. Today is a book review. Uh, so we're going to talk about a book called 30 Years This Much. Uh, it's a book which was uh, written by the one and only Josephine Olok. And uh, she wrote it uh, i read on um, on amazon uh, it was something concerning the dad and uh, she will tell us a little bit more about that so uh yes uh, welcome to the show so uh, let's dive deep into the questions um so josephine uh the guests <laughs> yes, they so today you're the guest. You're the guest. Yeah. Today. So I, 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 I ready to, you. to take as ready as as ready as I can be. As ready as I can be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, yeah, start from that. Okay, that's Thank the question you, you keep on asking people. Unless yes. you know the one who is being asked that question. Yeah, thank you very much, Deo. Um, well, first of all, I, I think I'm more an IT professional than I am an author. Um, I've been in the industry for quite a while. Uh, currently, I'm uh, I'm on a number of boards. Uh, I've been on boards for... I've had board-level experience for about 15 years uh, and across a number of sectors in fintech, banking, multimedia and manufacturing, oil and gas in the software industry. I also I'm also co-founder and director of um, of Lumjo Consultants, uh, where I have where uh, I have advised clients in different in different sectors, especially the financial sector. Um, uh, the companies I think we're making um, twenty wait we were we were formally established in two thousand and two, so that makes it twenty something years, right? My math has gone out of my head. I've also led IT programs in a number of institutions, including Talo Oil, uh, Barclays at the time, Equity Bank, Post Africa Online, the UN, and the Central Bank of Uganda. So that's that's my IT background. Um, I'm married, I have two grown children, um, so, and I'm in the stage of my of my career where I am able to do a number of different things, and that's how I found myself. Uh, Focusing on writing poems. I hope that that helped find a little bit. You can ask me if I haven't uh, provided enough detail. <laughs> <laughs> and that is well summarized. Yeah. And uh, the the CV is threatening, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the years. It's, it's when you when you get to my my years, you also have the same CV. It's just the number of years, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Number of years used well. Thank you. <laughs> and I would like to know the inspiration behind the book. What inspired you to start writing the book? Ah, yes. That that was um, the first book I bought. I was uh, second year in university. It was Maya Angelou's And Still I Rise. I read her a book and I was like, wow, her poems are fantastic. You know, they're they really you know, are. all about womenhood and the power of women and all that and i was so f fascinated by that and i felt if it would be wonderful if i could do that so i kind of started writing poems at that stage i remember this is university a long time ago so i just started my first poem um from that time that was my inspiration mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say Maya Angelou um, inspired you because you really embody her demeanor to me. <laughs> and, really? Uh, yes. <laughs> and um, I used to follow her. And when she died, I remember watching CNN. I was like, oh, I was <laughs> I was sad. But I've, I've also read quite a bit of her work. And you actually embody her demeanor. And it's just she carries herself and treats people. She treated people. Oh. Yes. Thank you. That's that's a real. I I don't feel like I can reach up to her <laughs> level, but thank you for saying that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So uh, a bit of uh, that uh, is uh, 
I wanted to to first chime in concerning uh, what I read, and I'm actually reading right now on uh, Amazon, uh, which says Josephine has been writing poetry for a while, and only recently decided to have them published in to uh, published to in the memory of of her father who passed away 30 years ago. She is an IT professional who is tapping into her creative side. So, yeah. how did this happen? Yeah, that, that's the, I think, insp being inspired by Maya Angela's book and then feeling that I, I could write, yes, that's happened. But to, to be honest, I don't see myself as a writer. I find it difficult to write long text. Uh, and I thought poems were the perfect, you know, it said, you know they're the perfect in between. You, you uh, the way I write poems is I, I think of if something comes to me, I write it down immediately and I write it in the form of a poem. I don't spend time, uh, re, you know, re you know, reviewing or perfecting it. I just write it as I, as I see it. I might, re I might refine a few sentences here and there, but uh, that form of writing really helps me because I find it really difficult to write long text. But I also like the way you can use a poem to release something, you know, whether it's anger, it is uh, a memory, it is whatever it is. I think I like the fact that once once I write it, it releases that feeling. So um, so that that that's that's what, why I like writing poems. But also, I think we can be so inspired by what's around us, by the people around us, by the things we see. Uh, and that's what helped me with, uh, with the poem writing. Mm. That's true. So um, now uh, we've really tapped into why you decided to do the poems. Uh, what what inspired the the cover page and the picture of the uh, of the author on the book? Okay, so maybe just to give a context of why I decided to publish. I think um, I I think I've told you all this a while ago. Um, to it was the year 2021 and uh, I'm a member of a book club called G4G uh, book club girls for girls book club and the first uh, book that we read was um, the year of, the year of yes by Shon, Shon, Shonda rhymes Shonda rhymes yes and uh, I was looking for a focus for the for my year because every year I start with the a word which is going to create a focus for my for my year so i thought oh that, that would be fantastic imagine if i i i i had a year of yes which meant i would take on all opportunities that came my way i would say yes to almost everything almost everything so i had been writing poems um for instance in recognition of, of birthdays family birthdays posting them on uh, facebook and all that and my friend saw them so poems and said oh i like the poem you wrote about your uh, your 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 daughter, I think it was. So I can't remember what it was. And um, and I said, yeah, I've been writing quite a few poems. In fact, I have quite a few. And she said, really, you have uh, quite a few poems. Like how many? And I said, oh, about maybe about fifty or so. And she said, why don't you publish a book? And I said, why? Why should I publish a book? I'm writing poems for myself. And uh, then I remembered what my commitment for the year was, which is a year of yes. So. I said, okay, why not? So I, I started the, the, the journey of publishing the book. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as I now started that journey of publishing the book, um, I realized that, um, one, I, I wanted the book to, because one of the things I really love is walking, and I wanted a book of somebody walking, you know, in the sunshine. But I also realized that 2021 was the was the year, 30 years since my father had passed on. And so that's how the title came. I enjoyed walking. So I tied that into the title and I tied that into my father's memory, which is 30 years this much. And uh, the image is somebody walking into the sunshine. And that that should have, should have been me, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, then the author picture, okay, uh, I use it because one, I didn't, I didn't want to go to the studio <laughs> to get a picture. 
as as big sheep. <laughs> so I and I I really like this picture, and I was thinking actually this picture talks to to my to when I start. This is around the time I started, so this is a picture of me. I think I just graduated, but I I just finished uh, university, I think. So I was like, yeah, this is around the time when I would have started writing. So I thought it fit. Um, yeah. The publishers didn't agree, but I I also wasn't going to back down because they were like, we, you need to go to the studio, you need to publish. And I was like, guys, this is good enough for me. So that's why I put the book mm-hmm. there. I know it doesn't look like me, but it is me. <laughs> <laughs> it's me <laughs> when I started writing. <laughs> if you squint a little... <laughs> the resemblance is not there i'm telling you <laughs> it is me. Really, mm-hmm. i mean it's okay. different hair maybe the face is, is younger yeah. but listen that's me <laughs> Back in okay. it's really it's yeah. a really nice picture thank you yeah yeah uh, what challenges did you face most uh in completing the book when you set out to write and then just completing the process what challenges did you face? Um, okay, I think what, when I went to, when I found uh, somebody who was willing to to publish a book, uh, they then started deciding how things should work. You know, like, you've got to group the, the poems together, you've got to do this, you've got to lengthen this one, you've got to change this. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was never my philosophy of, 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 of shaping, reshaping my mm-hmm. thoughts. Uh, so I have found myself having to revisit a lot of the poems and 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 to un- try and understand why I wrote them mm-hmm. and uh, what they were trying to say, who my audience was say, was, and then try and group them into related poems. I think that for me was a challenge because I never envisioned that I have to go through that process. At, at the end of the day, I thought to myself that I was writing for myself. Um, but then when it came to completing the book and publishing it, it was who's your audience, mm-hmm. uh, how does it come across. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, one of the, the uh, feedback I got was, hey, some of the, your poems are really harsh. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and she asked me, are you married? <laughs> I said, yes. And she said, you're still married? And I was like, yes. And she said, but some of these seem to be very much about uh, your marriage. And I said, they in the context of how I was feeling at that time, mm. they're not, they don't talk to my relationship or anything like that. They talk about to the feeling and it's just a snapshot in time. Mm. And sometimes it's not even about me. A lot of times it's not about me. It's about maybe somebody has told me a story or I know somebody who's experiencing something difficult. So, so yeah, so I, I found that challenging because um, I had to then become I had to then fit into a mold of yes. of, of the of the publishers of what they were expect expectations were of a book of a poem, book of poems. Mm. Yeah, I just like the themes and how they went. Uh, they moved into each other. Um, I could tell when it was exhilarating, when it was anguish. It it <laughs> they really put them all together. And, yeah. Um, yes, and to move into that, um, I'll read one stanza from a poem called the volcano uh it's the last stanza that says you took the fertile ground and tilled it until it would bear no more now um i am nothing more to you than a site that was once grand i once produced i once gave you value i hope you will now one day think of me and as the one you would think of me as the one who you once held in high esteem and yeah so i, I would imagine uh, what that person told you like until sharing a bit so much but also like you said could it doesn't have to be personal and we've all had those times when like um people treat you a certain way at some point you feel like you know you you have value and then <laughs> to your dismay or shock they'll show you you know what not that much and i wonder at what point in life did you write this specific poem do you remember okay i think um to me I, it was one of the first poems i wrote you know once i'd had children and um 
I think I, I, it, it, was, it, was, it was early, but what I realized very early on was that, um, and, and you notice that it falls under the, the theme of womanhood. Mm, yes. That as women, we are, we are only as good as uh, valued when, when you've got children um, and, you know, you produce children. But after a certain uh, point, perhaps once you've finished with the kids, mm. then your value kind of diminishes and you, you, can, you can often become invisible. Mm. So for me, the theme was, listen, I was this grand person. I was important in your, in your life and I was, you know, fertile. Mm-hmm. As a vol- as a, uh, the, the the volcano and the womanhood is kind of is uh, is is what I was trying to to relate. Mm-hmm. Um, I was once fertile. I produced. I was you know, and you had you saw me as valuable. Mm-hmm. But this is not just as a a person, not just as uh, say a husband and a wife thing. It's as society how society perceives women. Mm-hmm. So you saw me as valuable. But now, having given you the children, the volcano goes silent. Mm-hmm. And it's I like see. you just see it there, you know, it's in the background, but you don't really I care someone, about it anymore. I know yeah? someone who is for older women of layers, and they just found that so f- exactly. offensive. <laughs> you it's, know that things you normalize. <laughs> exactly, that's that's the problem. That is how we're seen. It's it's mm. and and you know, as women, because you, you know, you you could be in your family, you could be a very high ranking person. Yeah, in your family, your siblings are looking up to you. They respect you and they see value to you. Once mm-hmm. you get married, it, you become the outsider. But you mm-hmm. become somebody who is seen as you need to just produce for the next. Yet. You don't mm-hmm. belong, but we want you to produce the children. And once the children are there, it's like you're invisible. You know, you 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 get the situation where grandparents are always asking, "So how are the children?" It's like. How they're not are saying you? how are you <laughs> how are the <laughs> children yeah so that is a challenge that's what i was trying to write about it wasn't really about myself but it was what i saw uh as the experience of a lot of my friends and mm-hmm. how you know you you just feel like you, it's like you reach a a, a, a uh, you know you've you've, so, you've talked about off layers there's mm-hmm. also the sell by date mm. <laughs> <laughs> then you right. pass that. <laughs> that <the> everyone's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is that is what what I was trying to say there. So yeah, it's um, I think oh, to you the second part of the question. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not it's not about leaving a situation that doesn't serve you. It's about changing the narrative that doesn't serve you. Mm-hmm. So a narrative that says you as a woman are are past yourself by date, past your value years, that one is not correct. And it's us as women to empower ourselves to be to see ourselves as much more worthy. Yes, you are going to be invisible. I, I mean I I I know that uh, my, a lot of my friends say, you know, you, you can't even go to a shop and people don't notice you're there because they're seeing an older person. And an older woman. Uh, but I, I, for instance, I don't really mind about that, but I, I believe very strongly that we should continue to believe we can add value. We should continue to believe we can uh, transition into different state, into different career paths, different, take on different roles mm-hmm. if, as, we, as we, you know, as we mature. Because I, I don't expect, for instance, to be in the corporate world forever. Mm-hmm. So even though I have been defined by a title, um, after that stage, I shouldn't feel that I don't have anything to give. So I should be able to leverage my experience. I should be able to take on new roles. I should be able to continue my training, but not to to take on the the narrative that I'm gone, that I am I don't have a brain, I can't think, I don't think. So I think that's 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 what's been important, that it is changing the narrative about how people perceive you by doing what you feel that you can still do and knowing that you're worthy and you are able to do that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so that's that's really I didn't know this. No, I don't know I what you a lot, uh, no, I don't know what a lot. what did you think when you read that poem, Bill? Maybe you can uh, advise. Um uh, well, 
Uh, well, I'm not a woman, so what yeah. what you're saying is is like very insightful. <laughs> so when I'm getting a relationship, I but Del, you interface with so many women, so yes, <laughs> you have your mom, you have uh, you know, no, friends, no. What I'm trying to mean is, is what I'm trying to mean is is you don't. Some of these things are not usually talked about so much, like the fact that you are treated more of like. Uh, Uh, what, oh. uh, having just kids and all that and they don't consider you as actually a person with feelings and you actually have dreams and all that and so these are things which you don't usually hear but it's it's good that i am actually hearing them right now so okay. it will help me in my future we'll engagements be <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and i'm recruiting i i, I have... <laughs> oh wow so, interesting yeah so the next part is uh this this uh, another excerpt from uh, the book which is uh this one is uh, uh from page uh, 53 which is uh the first uh the first um, bus or paragraph so uh the suppression of speech the gauging of voices an arrest of rights the quiet that ens- ensues is not peace wow those are too many words put in one sentence mm-hmm. and i'm wondering now how 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 did this come about like you wanting to express yourself this way okay um this is i think this is under the subject our world right? our world yeah yes. so i was re- i was i think i was reacting to um i think the just before elections and the and the i think the right the 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 um I think there were riots that happened to something and and people were killed on the streets. So that was just my reaction to it. I felt that um it was it was a it was a it was saying basically that we we claim that we have peace in this country. But what is what does how do you define peace? How is peace defined? Uh just because you use military force and you gag people arrest people and then you have quiet in the streets that is not peace peace really is about the freedom to uh, of speech and the freedom to be you know at least with some level of right i think that is what i was talking about there um because when you forcefully bring about peace it's not real mm-hmm. because that is just people go to their houses and hide because they're fearful of being arrested or being gagged um and therefore that, that that is what i i meant i was writing about that i was reacting to that um and i felt it it, it really was not as that that kind of peace is real not peace peace really is the freedom to to vote the pre- freedom to 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 at least express some your opinions and the right to be for that opinion to be different from the ongoing narrative yeah mm-hmm. That's true. And also in the wake of the Kenyan uh, protests that have been happening these past three weeks with so sometimes you ask yourself, are you silent or you're being silenced? And do you know we saw so many people, even younger than I am, on the streets expressing their views about this finance bill that was uh, bringing punitive uh, taxes and it's unfortunate that people died but i i, I just uh, found it so special that uh, people were first of all aware of what was happening around them and what these taxes meant and then they also had the right to go to the streets and express or some <laughs> it was even funny that the people who didn't go to the streets some people hacked like government systems and told them you know what we can reach you we may not have guns but this is how we are protesting and um also like gagging of voices sometimes also maybe like also like maybe in a friendship circle and also um maybe family also sometimes you don't feel like um speaking because you want to keep that peace but you know it's eating you up and you wonder if you if you have to keep silent to keep the peace whose peace are you keeping is the peace yeah. of that that someone who is 
oppressing you suppressing your feelings so if you can't express yourself that's not yeah. peace exactly yeah exactly okay and very, um, very touching subjects <laughs> Yes, we have to yes. talk. The big idea. Seems 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 we are opening up all the ones. Angela is very passionate. Very passionate. Very passionate. No, as girls, you know, they teach you to just be a certain way. You know, just keep the peace. Mm. You don't. Yes. You, yes. Yes. Too much. But you know, who's peace are you keeping? Because if it's oppressing you, you you just say, speak. Yeah. exactly then, yeah then if someone yeah. has to up, uphold something that's oppressing you that's not someone you have to be around it it, that, it can be a friend a family member mm-hmm. and how yeah. do you usually manage such a situation so so there was there's this group called girls for girls you can't be part of <laughs> <laughs> Ah, good one good one <laughs> do boys for boys but anyway boys so we have a um a module called the art of communication and you learn to communicate without even fighting you just learn to express yourself and be heard and make sure you get results sometimes it's a win win sometimes you have to compromise but at least you speak you can you, you we are told not to enter meetings and be quiet being wallflowers speak it will it won't hurt anyone yes you learn to yeah. speak tactfully but also getting what you want to um across Well, the main key takeaway is is wallflowers. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. You know, I I get the point. Like you yeah. have to don't let someone's peace be your 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 your, your sense of um, you fail to actually express yourself because you want to maintain peace and that that exactly. happens a lot especially if you're young mm-hmm. there's that thing where they they be like mm, be quiet mm-hmm. because okay. they, they don't want, and you don't express yourself and it it chimes into even the workplace that mm-hmm. even if something is not working well for you you're quiet because you you you're worried that uh what you say will not be liked and people won't react the way you are actually want them to react i'm now opening yeah. up my own wins <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway it works uh, it works there yeah. it works <laughs> you're healing those wounds there yeah, not... yes yeah, yeah okay so uh angel the next one is uh Oh okay. So the next mm. one is from the, back to the theme of womanhood. I found it interesting. I actually laughed at the end. So <laughs> <laughs> this poem is called The Ex Lover and I'll read the last stanza. It says, "Chosen as you are, justified as you are, undeniably intelligent, you exercise extreme confidence, never failing to surpass others' actions. It surprises me how insensitive, how loud, how unappealing you can be." what was i thinking <laughs> <laughs> this okay. is what were you thinking when you wrote this <laughs> this was this was i think this is one of my first poems hmm? mm. and i wrote it uh after a breakup mm. i think it was one of okay not my first boyfriend but like my first boyfriend at uni mm. so i broke up i had broken up with him um and I was really mad really angry um he was one of those people who was always right he was smart and all that but always i always felt being put uh, he was put down um uh, put he put me down a lot mm-hmm. um and i think i even talked about uh, hair i think i talked about hair mm-hmm. i mentioned fact. yeah i mentioned hair uh, ram wrote no no that but yeah but mm-hmm. yeah but anyway Uh, not- yeah so he was always you know you know a great a great person and all that but always putting me down so i wrote that from a a, a, a position of uh, from a place of anger i was angry i was annoyed as thing is and when i wrote it, it really really clarified for me my anger and it even even uh, resolved not to not to you know because i'd broken up with him before but i resolved that i would not 
I would not go back. So it really clarified for me what what was happening there, that he was just somebody who knew it all and was always putting me down. Mm-hmm. So that that really helped. That really helped me say to myself, actually, you don't have to be in a relationship where somebody puts you down, however that person is, however good they're look, looking, however smart they are. Um, you can you can walk away and insist that these are going to be the standards that you set for your life. These are the boundaries that you're going to set. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perfect. It's interesting how we understand life in re- retrospect and we have to leave it forward. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, on to page 84, which talks about... Mommy. 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 Being, I think it's part of life and love. Yeah. Oh. No, defining myself. Yeah. Is it part of, yeah, defining. It's defining myself, yes. It's on page 87. 87. Yeah, defining myself, yeah. Okay. Ah, so that is... Uh, the first, mm, the third one, okay, the third. Broke, no argument. They are not, they are not disrespect. Consequence of authoritarian mommy. Consequences ah. severe. Severe, okay. Yeah. Yes. Consequences. Uh, oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm worried for my life. But anyways. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you want what's the question? So I, I guess this is when you are trying to stand your ground as a mother and uh ensuring that <laughs> things are happening according to your rules. Mm, what was it about? No. So this mm. was about my mom. Uh, my mama's most traditional moms that I know are strict, really strict. You step out of line, you get whacked. Um, her thing was she used to have this thing of if um, if if you did something stupid, if you're in the same room, she would she would take her shoe and throw it. Standard African. Now, yes. <laughs> now the problem was if it missed you. She would say, bring me the shoe. <laughs> and then she, she aims again. <laughs> if she missed you, <laughs> you're almost in more trouble because <laughs> at least when <laughs> at least at least when you're far, the, the pain is not as, as bad, right? But when you take the shoe to her, it's like you are going to peel that shoe a lot mm-hmm. more, many more times. So my mom was authoritarian. She was very strict. Uh, set very high standards for everything, for cleanliness, for school, for respect, for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, as a child, when you want to play, you, you, you often don't um, appreciate that this is about upbringing. So, but and underneath it all, it was how she, what, how she knew how to raise us. But she also gave us that feeling that she was there for us, that she was our protector, because I'm sure, I never felt that uh, if anything happened, that she would not be there to defend us, you know, at all costs. Mm-hmm. So she was this, a very t- a strong figure in our lives, mm-hmm. towering figure, and I knew she could do anything. Um, um, and one of the things that she did was um, we we had to go into exile. And um, we, during our mean days, we had to go into exile and... Um, my father was tipped off and he left early. He went ahead of us. Mm-hmm. So when Amin's people came, they took her and, and she was arrested. Now, how she got out, I don't know. But she managed to get out. The day she got out, I had a driver and we drove across to Nairobi. But all of this, you know, you could see that this is somebody who was, you could see that she was suffering, but you could see that she had some real strong inner sense of strength some real strength i don't know where it was coming from um of course we felt we 
felt there was something really wrong because we were very young at the time. But mm. you could see that this is somebody who was determined to get us to safety. Mm. Um, the only thing was we had a, I think the driver was a um, nice driver, but he really got the, when he messed up, he really got a uh, rough. <laughs> That, what are you doing here? You because know, you could see there was a lot of tension. So she kept telling him off, and I was feeling really sorry for him. But definitely, from that time when I, I saw, uh, you know, that this strong woman figure in my life and who who was, you know, willing to do everything it took to protect us. Uh, and I thought that was wonderful. So it's, it's yes, you messed up, you, are, you knew about it. But she also, you know, if you did right, she raised, and she did good, and she was always, you know, looking after us in 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 circumstances which were not ideal, especially when we went into exile. But yeah, I I think that that was um, some of those habits now have come through in my life. I, I I definitely didn't want to be as strict as she was with my children, mm -hmm. uh, but I also wanted them to be um, properly brought up, you know, respectful, doing their chores, and not not you know. Uh, just uh, having standards in life. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a lesson that I that I've carried uh, that I've carried. I hope that it has translated well <laughs> to those who are interacting with my adult children. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we we did our best. That we had a good foundation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do you know uh, there is a book by Maya Angelou that it's called Me, Mom, and Me. And yes. it also talks about her relationship with her mom and her mom had abandoned them with their with her brother but it talks about like how she like now navigating the the ins and outs of bonding and accepting you know you never know what people go through and despite yeah. that she's your mom she's also a person herself and yeah so navigating forgiveness and acceptance you know when i read this poem it also just described like my relationship with my mom. She was also very disciplinarian, but also loving. There's this tanza that says, um, brook no, no argument. They are not disrespect. Consequences were severe, authoritarian, mommy, but loving, generous, kind, protector, mommy. And that embodies so many of uh, uh, African moms because, you know, they just want the best for you you know people say mom knows best actually when you grow up you realize mom knows best <laughs> and mom exactly knows best. <laughs> yeah especially when you especially when you become a mother yourself you're like oh yes yes it's what so you meant. actually yeah 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 mm. you find also moments when i have friends who are moms and they're like oh okay i'm turning into my mom <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Did you have those moments like oh, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, this, yes, I did. Yeah. Things have to be in order and there's yes. always a right way to do things that my mom would oh, say. Yeah. You have to do what you have to do to yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Those moments were many, yeah. But I, I, I it, they really, really need you to appreciate uh mm. that your mom, yeah. And then and this is uh, the, the reason for the book. <laughs> it's called 30 Years This Year. And um, I could say, uh, rest in peace to your loving dad. <laughs> I could tell um, you have so many fond memories of him. Yeah. And um, so I'll read the first stanza. Uh, it dawns on me this day in March that it has been three decades since you quietly left this world, I think I have accepted this, but how can I pretend? And um, I would like to ask, what are some of your fondest memories of your dear dad? Uh, yeah, my dad was um, uh, <clears throat> quiet. So if you imagine the contrast between him and my mom, my mom was always, you know, the authoritarian, the yes. disciplinary, the one who's strict. But my dad, you, you could sit somewhere and you would be, you wouldn't even think he was there. He's very quiet, very unassuming. Um, and he had some. He was very. Um, he, he could read. He always was reading what was going on. And sometimes, you know, you you you'd get in an argument with your mom or something, and then. 
maybe later he'll say perhaps you you've not it done happened. what she wanted to do you know he was very his perspective was very sharp very good but he was of course very smart and very intelligent um i i just i i think it it took me a while to to realize that um that um of course, he was always doing the best for us, but also it took me to realize when I grew up, I think it was when I realized that actually people are different depending on where they are. Because one one day I I came across, I we went to um, a club where he was a, a member and I I heard laughter with, you know, he was, he was sitting with his friend and he was laughing, they were telling jokes and I was like, Oh, you mean you know <laughs> this guy? <That's> <laughs> this guy laughs and he's kind of very animated and very talkative. And I realized actually that's how we all are. It's like um, at, at our core we are perhaps introverted and all that, but there there are circumstances because I'm considered very quiet. But when I'm with my friend, you wouldn't think that I'm introverted. I will, will talk and laugh and yell because you're really feeling comfortable to be. You know, to be whatever how you are, but my dad was generally quiet with us. Uh, I think, as with most um, most African. Um, African men, yeah, it's it's like they leave the the hard things to mm. to especially the kids' issues, problem kids, and all that to the mom, and they 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 kind of like uh, they provide a kind of soft landing for you, um, especially when you want a bit of escape from. When you've been in trouble a little bit with your mom, then you run and you're like, he won't say anything, but you know, you feel that at least he's maybe he's on my side. That cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good cop, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was very generous. It was, it was very kind. I mean, it, to be honest, um, I think when he passed on, I was just getting to that stage where I was becoming an adult and starting to relate to him as an adult mm. uh, unfortunately then he passed away um so that opportunity was missed so a lot of the, my interactions with him was as a dad not as mm. seeing him as somebody else other than a dad you know so yeah mm. but it's very very kind and a nice nice person yeah good to know the apple doesn't fall far from that tree <laughs> <laughs> yeah so as we are wrapping up, uh, are there any other personal poems you actually you enjoyed out of the ones you you wrote? Uh, there were quite a few. There was one I wrote about my friend. There was actually for the, there was a one about the riots that I wrote, um, which really which I, I felt I don't know where it came from, but I I, I felt so so emotional about it. They, it was about this, during the riots when, when people were killed, about this boy who was killed um, and about the story of uh, a journalist who tried to save save the boy. Um, let me see, I'm just trying to find it. Um, I thought that was really moving and I thought that was very brave of her. So she, she saw the boy get, she saw the boy was shot Mm. And she 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 got a border, she carried him in his arms, carried him, took him to hospital. Unfortunately he he passed yeah. on. Mm. Yeah, he didn't make it. Um I think that was I don't know where that came from, but I think that was one of the mm. for me that was one of the most moving uh yeah, it's it's called It's Hopeless. Which page is it? Um uh, just trying to find it. It's hopeless, page fifty six. I, I can I'll read it to you. Then you will see the context of that. Of course, I should have perhaps put why I wrote it and all that. But you know, as I said, I was <laughs> I wrote this poem for myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's it's hopeless. It's hopeless, helpless. She's stricken, paralyzed by grief. My instincts kick in. Maybe I console. I demand. I am directed. I grab him in my arms. I appeal to him. Please, please live for her sake. His eyes flicker open and close again. There's hope. I hand him over. I pray, I plead, I post. I'm covered in his blood. I'm stung by my guilt. He's her son. He's my son. He's our son. He passes on. He was our child, struck by a bullet. We had clung on to hope. 
but how hopeless it all is. So the the first the 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 first uh, thingy is about the lady the, the the journalists sees the mother weeping. So it's she sees the mother weeping. The boy has been shot. Then she she springs into action. She gra- she gets a border border. She carries him. She get, jumps on the border. They rush and 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 in the journey she. She she keeps called, saying please wake up you know she's trying to get him to respond hoping that he still has life in him and she goes she takes him to to a clinic nearby clinic she leaves him there and um, of course she's covered in in blood and she she, she prays that is is okay she puts uh, she posts on social media unfortunately he passes I felt so moved by that uh, and I had to, I felt I had to write that uh, that poem and I shared it with her as well. Mm, it's so nice and yeah. also you know she's so called jocelyn jocelyn Nakibule, something like that the journalist yeah in in the recent uh kenyan riots there's also a 12 year old boy who suffered eight gunshot wounds and he also didn't make it unfortunately and during the presidential uh uh press conference he also the president also felt thought that the boy had made it but you could see it dawning on him how serious this thing is because they asked him you know this boy got shot eight times and he asked oh but he's still alive right and then they told me, no, eight times mm-hmm. eight yeah. eight times it was so sad sad yeah. to see such experience yeah. but yeah the yeah. times that we live in yeah this poem to him <laughs> it fits mm-hmm. so well and it's yeah. sad to see these things repeat in our society. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, uh, my my favorite poem is my the last my dad's poem. But um, yeah, that was uh, the other one who, that really got me the the boy. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's so nice. I like this stanza that says, "Your calm and gentle soul, quiet and an amazing demeanor, your love and esteem for me." Thoughts of you are overwhelming physically. You have gone, but but you see that you carried it on. That you know what, my dad believes in me, and that attests to so much of your confidence as a girl. When yes. first of all, at home, you know you're loved. <laughs> no, yeah. loved that they believe in me. No one can tell you anything, mm. and it matters most. Like when it comes from your dad, that kind of affirmation. Yes, it's, it's it really does. Yeah, yeah, it really does. So, uh, I was still taking in all the stories and and uh, experiences. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just keep quiet and just take it in and you're like, okay, yes. Yeah. So, um, the final question. Do you expect uh, to publish more books? Because clearly there's a lot for you to explore. Are you still creating more poems in hiding? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the in hiding part. Yes, I do. I am writing poems. Um, but as I said, I need to be, my poems come from, uh, I don't think about the poems. They come from an experience. I, I, if something happens and I'm, I think about writing it, I'll write it. The, the challenge I have now, um, I do get a lot of inspiration from walking and things like that. If I don't, if I think of a poem and I don't write it down immediately, it disappears. <laughs> so that is, the, that is my only challenge. But yes, I'm still writing. Um, and I, my plan is actually was to write, do another a book of poetry. Uh, but then I have that friend in my ear who's like, oh, you need to do your autobiography okay. whatever and i'm like now nah, imagine that huh? That's <laughs> imagine that ju- that would be a serious stress <laughs> 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 for me Is poems it? it's a few stanzas one one two three four and i'm done but now imagine but an autobiography you, but you can get a, a writer for you just be talking the and you, uh, basically yeah having a conversation with him that works better because like most they, of the authors actually now like for Elon Musk uh, like yeah. for I believe most of them like even uh, this one of um, Can't Hurt Me one of David Godin's it's always okay. also the same thing they mm. usually get someone who has been writing for quite some time then basically they have a yes. conversation then they pick out the story out of it all 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. With that that's just an option. Yeah, I guess or so. Or you could actually even create a, another podcast <laughs> dedicated to poems. Yeah, I guess so. Mm. Yeah. I guess so. I okay, no, that's good. Mm. Yeah. It, it's it's I think it's one of those things I just have to do. I just find a way way that works. But the poems is easy for me. Um because it's I don't I, I'm not expecting to you know to be on a, any uh book sale top of the list of any uh, whatever top of the list of anything it's not i don't write the poems for to make money mm. i write them to to express feeling to to get something out or you know to to appreciate to to show to you know to show something but um definitely i will write another book and and i'm in the middle of of the second book of poems uh, but the autobiography i have to really think hard about that Mm. Okay. But uh having said that, I want to say thank you so much for wanting to have to cover this uh, book. Mm. And I know I know my, one of my first I think Dio was one of the people who purchased the book first and and posted. So thank you Dio. <laughs> and thank you Angela thank for, you. for for buying the book. This so my thank you. Yeah, my question to you is what lessons did you pick from the book and uh, what are your personal favorites from each of you favorite, favorite poems mm. wow yeah now that i'm turning the the, the table you, you really know how to turn the tables <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> okay it's a I book review I... which means you need to have read it <laughs> did i go yes angela go ahead okay. Mine is uh my personal favorite is uh on page 28 it's called the new year. Okay. It, I'll read maybe just the first stanza. It's a new yeah. year, new beginnings, new blessings, new resolve, new attitude, attempt to reflect and wonder. I just like that the hope that it gave me is just you know just shake it off, shake it off and then keep moving. <laughs> and yeah. Because you know, like some poems were really sad and exhilarating. You get get you get that anguish, but this just gave me a breath of fresh air. It's like you know what, life happens, but you have to keep moving. Yeah, yes. and and lessons. What are the some lessons you got from the book? Oh, uh, lessons. Uh, uh, trusting yourself more to uh, like set boundaries and also. uh like moving forward in life yeah mm. thank you for that <clears throat> so first of all you put me on the line like this <laughs> yes that was I the idea expect, <laughs> i didn't i didn't expect That's it no question. i i always do it to you but i didn't know it was going to happen to me today <laughs> seriously <laughs> given this is a book review deo <laughs> yeah Anyways, so I think the one which has caught my eye is um am I powerful? Uh I think I'll read the second uh, paragraph. My title diminished, my wealth trampled, my esteem shattered, my dignity destroyed. Am I am I nothing at home? Um for this one I feel like uh, I've there's always that thing I, i don't i like this toy kind of nature where um, i don't want to over attach myself to things to to show that i'm actually doing well that is why even sometimes i i have a hard time actually expressing my happiness or when things are going well I'm, people are like yes i'm like yeah it's okay <laughs> so like yeah i that this kind of relates to to that kind of nature of me and and uh, not letting it get to your head and always staying humble even if things are going yeah so i think that's that's the lesson i picked out of the book and mm. yes okay it's interesting mm. that you you picked that one right because uh because that's that's a poem uh about domestic abuse. Mm. They are mm. well, it's melancholy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. I'm actually quite surprised. 
So basically what it's saying is that, um, unfortunately, it's, it's very common. Uh, domestic abuse is very common. Mm. And it happens to all women, um, including the very powerful ones. Mm. So, so in this poem, it's about here's a woman who is well known in society. She's a leader. She's mm. she has a big car. She has a big office. Uh, in the office, she's powerful. But when she gets home, she's complete. She completely diminished and put down by her husband. Mm. And 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 it's it's basically her realizing. Um, after being battered and bruised, that it was either she stands up and leaves, or she stays and and is killed. Mm. So that was that was the, the essence of the story. It's based on um, on you know the, the, the fact that there are women out there who are who are abused domestically, even when they have powerful job offices, job in the office. Of course, there are women who are abused across all levels of society mm. but that's that's what i i intended there so it's very interesting that you picked up there to be yeah. more inclusive there are also men who are abused <laughs> that's true that's true so yeah but you see it's it's womanhood it was under it's the weird. thingy woman so. <laughs> uh, but yeah i think the the first part of it uh i think i resonate with it more the first mm. bit of it because uh no like if you read the first few few lines which is i have a big office a car at my disposal a big title i am powerful i am powerful in my office <clears throat> my title diminished my worth trampled my self-esteem shattered my dignity destroyed and i am worth i am nothing at home yeah uh when that I feel like sometimes we have like a persona we have and we want to live so much into that persona. That's that's the perspective I got in this first bit of it. That we have that image we always have and sometimes when it is shattered we, we, we try to cling and yes. try to put it back together. But at the end of the day we, we should not over detach from that. But if you further go on, uh, further on read, that's when you now come up with that aspect of actually a woman who feels less empowered because of being being battered, and there's always that thing of um, of um, battered woman woman syndrome where the person actually, even if they're in a relationship which is terrible they have lived their lives mostly in that and they've seen that happen in many of the communities and that is like a normal which is weird if if you're you're, you're looking at it but at the same time when you're that person you don't see it like that that is why there is uh counseling and all that yeah, so right. yeah that's, that's the, so the second bit of it dives into now a person who actually has a lot of power in one aspect of their lives, but the other aspect of their lives, they actually what? Having a different kind of part. powerless. They feel they're powerless. powerless. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Mm. Mm. So, yes. Thank you for this book. Uh, we are it's definitely I, I think I should keep you accountable to to because our first conversation was about Actually, you having a, a sub stack for your newsletters. <laughs> you, I remember that conversation very well. I do. I, I do. So, I don't know what you're going to put me into, but I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about this, the direction of this conversation. <laughs> Anyway, let me end it there before you collapse <laughs> along the way. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for, for listening. Uh, check us. Uh, like and comment and subscribe. Uh, this has been a great conversation. And uh, check out Josephine's book. It's actually on Amazon. And if you're in Uganda, Aristo also has the book. So, you can go to any outlet of Aristo and you actually get the book. Other than that, actually, check out another episode which is uh 
episode 13, which is with uh, Josephine, and uh, we actually reviewed a book called um, 8020 Principle. Uh, other than that, uh, see you all in the next episode.